Hello everyone. It's uh, good to be with you again. Now, hopefully we'll see if we'll do this. Here we go. We'll do that. Sorry. Here we go. Uh, where on I hope. It's good to see you everybody. I'm here. I just need to wait for this first 20 seconds, 20 seconds or so as we uh, check that everything is okay and our volume's working and things like that. And here, there, oh, there we go. I've got this, um, I've got to turn that down. Here we go. So welcome to Camden Haven Anglican Church Drill Down. This is the time when we look a little bit more at the passage that we've looked at at church on Sunday. Often what happens, well, most of the time what happens when someone prepares a sermon is they're not trying to work out what to say in the end. They're trying to work out what not to say, what to leave out. So often you can prepare a sermon and sometimes you could leave out 80 or 90 percent of what, what's, been, what's been prepared and what's been researched and sort of just skim the cream off the top, so to speak. So uh, we are planning as a church to keep on doing this. However, this will be the last one for the year and we'll start again in February. Uh, in February, we've got a series on going global. Uh, that's gonna be really great. And uh, it's a topical series. Uh, but we'll be still each week looking at passages from Scripture. But today we are looking at Luke chapter 2 and verses, let's have a look. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verses 8 uh, all the way through to verse 20. So Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 20. So um, uh, if you've got your Bible... Now is the time to uh, check it out, to open it up, and to get looking at that passage. So I'll give you a couple of moments to grab that and to uh, have your Bible in front of you, because you want to be able to, to look at the whole thing. I, I, I find that using an actual book like one of these is uh, much better, because as you're reading sections, as you're reading a section, you can, um, you can see... Uh, what's around it better than when you are just have your phone or something like that. Your phone really limits you to a very small amount of space, but the, uh, the Bible uh, as a book, you can see what's happening around that sort of thing. Um, so here we go. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 and following, and... I'm just making sure I've got, so I can see your questions. Who have we got here? We've got Lois. G'day. So I suppose that means Gary's there as well, possibly. Uh, we have June Walker. Hello, June. Uh, Cheryl and Alan Cooper and Graham and possibly Jeanette as well. So it's good to see you all. One of the things I want, to, one of the ways that I want to think about this passage is ask that question that was on there, that one. Why shepherds? Why shepherds? Why, why do you think the shepherds are so prominent in this story? Uh, if you were to look carefully, well, not even that carefully, you've got um, shepherds right at the beginning. Oh, we just lost that. You've got shepherds right at the beginning. So let's do this and do this. Sorry, excuse me, just while I get this ready. We just had a problem there. Okay, now we go back to that. Uh, when you, you see right at the beginning, we've got, uh, there were shepherds living in the fields. You've got shepherds right here. And then right to the end, again, the shepherds returned. So there is this, the shepherds are quite prominent in this story. So I suppose I want to ask the question, why shepherds? Why shepherds? I wonder what you think. So after I ask that question, I've got about 20 seconds to wait before you hear me ask that question. So we're going to be thinking about this. I'm going to bide a bit of time, twiddle my thumbs, check that I'm in focus like that. There we go. Unshaven. Sorry about that. Why shepherds? 
Why did angels appear to shepherds? Sorry if you can hear my dog back barking in the background. Uh, was it possibly that uh, Mary went into labour quite late at night and the only people who were still awake were shepherds watching over their flocks by night? So the angels thought, well, everyone else is asleep. We'll go and talk to them. Don't want to wake anyone up. Probably not. Why shepherds? Why shepherds? I know you're thinking, I can't see anything written here, but I know you're thinking. Why shepherds? I'll give you, let's say, let's say another 40, oh, oh, Cheryl Cooper or Alan Cooper, one of the two, have said ordinary people. Yeah, I think certainly it, it's, it's difficult because it doesn't really say why. So in some sense, we have to surmise. But yes, ordinary people. Uh, Graham, maybe Jesus had come to fleece us, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> Actually, we'll get back to that, exactly that point. Sort of, not exactly sort of, but we will get back to that point about fleecing the flock very soon. Well, uh, OK, so we've got this. We, we, we've got here right from verse eight. So let me just keep that question. Uh, Joanne Call says the lowly in society, possibly nomadic. Yeah, uh, Jesus was a shepherd. June Walker says Jesus was a shepherd. Uh, we're going to come back to that as well. <clears throat> so uh, what we're going to do is we'll we'll dive into the passage. So we'll do it this way, which I think is the best way to do it. Let's um, have a look here and we'll make that a bit bigger so you can see it. So here we go. Verse eight. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will be that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. Here's the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So if we just uh, scroll back slightly, let's have a look here. We've got here, here in verse four, that town is Bethlehem. OK, so we've got Bethlehem, that town. And that town, Bethlehem, is the town of David. Very important things here. Bethlehem is the town of David. And David was a shepherd. True, that's true, Joanne. Yep. Uh, we will come back to that as well. So the angels say to the shepherds, I bring you good news today in the town of David. Now we know, we know that the town of David is Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the town of David. And there is an Old Testament reference to that, which I want to take you to now. So let me um, find that. Let me make it a bit bigger so it's easy to see. And let's go across to that. So here we've got Micah chapter 5. It says this, Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem. So let me just go back. Uh, this section here is talking about opposition that Israel will face, particularly opposition to Israel's ruler. Now, I don't know if I've signed in, so it's going to do that. Yes, I have. It's to Israel's ruler. And uh, they're going to strike him on the cheek with a rod. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge, a, um, a, a declaration of war in a way. And then the prophecy from Micah is about where the ruler will come from. But you, Beth Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be a ruler over Israel, 
whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labour bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. So what we see in that prophecy from Micah is a clear reference to the promised son being born in Bethlehem. Now, little detour for a moment. When thinking through the persuasive power of prophecy, this is one of those times when we see a prophecy written, established hundreds of years prior to Christ, saying the king will be born in Bethlehem. Now, it's difficult. There, there are some prophecies that Jesus could have read up and thought, "Oh, I'm just going to be. The, I'm just going to learn all those prophecies and fulfil them, and more. I'm going to at least say that I'm fulfilling them. Some big scam." But it's pretty hard to work out where you or, or to stage where you're going to be born. Uh, that's a slightly more difficult thing. But we find here, as you can see there in that text, that Bethlehem. Although it's small among the clans of Judah, a city, a town, a very small town, this is the one from whom the ruler over Israel will come. So we've got this promise here of a ruler from Israel coming from Bethlehem. <clears throat> so we go back to that text. Let's, uh, let me just grab that one again so that we're on the right page. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great crowd or company of heaven, the heavenly host appeared with the angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So one of the things to note is it's not a great choir of heaven. We think the Hallelujah Chorus was originally sung by a choir of angels. And the answer is no. It was sung by a company of angels. Now this is... Uh, this is military language. You, you belong to a company. Uh, sometimes when it's a host of the heaven, uh, a company of the heavenly host. So it's a, it's a company of the heavenly army. So we ought not to imagine when this hallelujah chorus or glory to God in the highest is being sung, that it's sung by, you know, hallelujah. This is, this is deep army, scary, terrifying angels, probably thousands of them, singing glory to God. So when you see a choir singing, you think, ah, that's nice. But when you see an army singing, that's a whole different thing. Uh, recently, so let me put it this way. Uh, recently, I did a funeral for a New Zealand a lady from New Zealand, and as the casket was being taken out, uh, they did the haka. Now I'm standing there, right in front of me. All these pretty big people, pretty big New Zealanders, are going mad with this haka. I wouldn't have said, "Oh, isn't that a nice." A nice song they're singing. No, it, it's almost, it's a war cry. And here, this great company of the heavenly host appearing with the angels, it's a war cry. It's a declaration of war. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's, it's, it's a declaration that the king is here, the promised son of David. David, who was promised by God 
that one of his descendants would reign and rule not only over the Israel, but over the whole world and not temporarily, but forever. So here we've got a very significant warlike announcement being made. Now war, it's not very Christmassy, is it? And yet war is very Christmassy. Uh, Christmas, uh, war is what Christmas is all about, you could say. Um, so let's go back to the passage. So I want to come back to some of these things, that question that I had before about the um, why shepherds. But we'll come back to that in a moment. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So um, what I'm going to do is just get you to open up your Bibles at Ezekiel chapter 34. So I'm going to find it here. So if you don't have your Bible with you, let me hopefully it opens up. We can uh, have a look at a very important theme in the Old Testament. And you'll see it very soon as I go through this. <clears throat> uh, that's why men singing on mass is awesome. Yes. It's always good for men to sing. I think we're singing this week. We sang last week at five o'clock church. 9.30 this week we'll be singing. Masks are, as it says, strongly recommended or should be worn. Should doesn't mean must, but I think we ought to be conscious of those others who are concerned about infection and the like. So let's have a look at Ezekiel chapter 34, because what I want to point out is when you, when you hear about, when, when we're mm, presented with shepherds, and I ask the question, why shepherds? And we begin to surmise, well, maybe they were this, maybe they were that. One of the things I think is worth doing is looking into the Old Testament and seeing that there is a very, very strong theme of shepherding in the Old Testament. And that's what I want to show you now in Ezekiel chapter 34. So let's, let's flick to that. Oh, that, that one. <clears throat> I just see a message from Joanne Call here. It says, My recent study said, From its birth, the Christian faith has been an evangelical religion, for it cannot keep its good news to itself. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to flick back to that. Uh, absolutely. There is always the uh, response when hearing the good news to then speak it. So, in Thessalonians, they heard it, received it, and it rang out from them. So the ringing out of the message is critical in our lives. And we ought to look for opportunities where, to be able to, uh, uh, to share that message. And sometimes we need to be bold and say it when we don't feel like it. But I want to say most of the time we've got to be wise a wisdom is what's required, but boldness, yes, but more than that, wisdom, because it's very easy to feel guilty that we didn't say something, but possibly and probably most of the times we were wise enough to know that wasn't the time to speak. So it's good for us to pray, uh, Lord, give me an opportunity to speak the gospel to somebody, to share the gospel with somebody, and then keep our eyes wide open for opportunities because they will come. But back to Ezekiel, here we go. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy against them and to say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you, what? Shepherds of Israel, you who, are, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick 
or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. We will look a bit more at that Ezekiel 34. I'm going to read you quite a large slab in a minute. But the theme of shepherds is quite strong in the Old Testament. And a shepherd was a teacher. The way that a teacher shepherded was by teaching. And shepherding included all of those things, strengthening the weak, healing the sick, binding up the injured, uh, caring, teaching, directing, uh, those sorts of things. These shepherds, however, the shepherds of Israel, had begun to, and go back to Graham's comment before, literally fleece the flock. Uh, it even says there that the they had become food for the shepherds. So that how opposite that is. Rather than watching and looking after the sheep, these shepherds had begun to eat the sheep. They were acting exactly like the wolves that they were meant to be protecting the sheep from. They had become what they were meant to protect the sheep from. It's, it's ironic, isn't it? So there is this strong theme of the shepherds in the Old Testament. And I feel like we can't not hear that when we hear the shepherds arrive. And one of the reasons that I think this is a strong point is because remember that passage from, and I'll show it to you, that passage from Micah, which talks about where, where the Saviour will be born, the ruler, I should say, over Israel will be born. And what happens in verse, so you've got here, verse 3, verse 2, verse 3. Now let me scroll up. What's the next thing that happens? He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of, of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And uh, it goes on. There's, there's even more talk about shepherds later. But uh, really, see that he will stand and shepherd his flock. Now, I think there is this uh, clear connection between the prophecy that the child will be born in Bethlehem, which is what the Luke chapter 2 pushes. Here is Bethlehem, town of David, town of David, city of David. This is where you know, it goes over and over and over. This is Micah 5 is ringing in the background. And verse 4, straight after it talks about where the son of the, the ruler will be born, it describes him as a shepherd. So I think from this passage, we're beginning to see that that Jesus is not only the King of Kings and not only the Lord of Lords, but he is the shepherd of shepherds. And here are shepherds. Now, just, just notice how these shepherds are described. Let's go back to that. Oops, I keep going to the wrong Bible. How are they described, these shepherds? And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. And what were they doing? They were keeping watch, keeping watch over their flocks at night. These are faithful shepherds. These are shepherds who are doing what they're meant to do. They're keeping watch. They're not fleecing the flock. They're not eating the flock. Another excursus. What Israel's experience was of the teachers at the time was that they, the teachers of the time had worked out ways of comfort and rest and, um, and to benefit financially from being the leaders. So they, hence they were fleecing the flock. 
And I think that you don't have to look very far to find out that that happens in our world as well. Uh, you have all sorts of uh, characters who in the name of God will call themselves apostles or prophets or something. Uh, a continual asking of people for money. A, uh, a call for uh, people to help them to buy their second or third jet. Uh, they'll justify it. They'll say, shouldn't the word of God get around faster? Why would we want to delay it by getting on a slow plane? If you really believed that the gospel message was important to go out, then you would make sure we've got an accessible Cessna. Oh, well, I don't know, maybe Graham can um, help me out with the uh, type of aeroplane you need. But some sort of um, uh, private plane that can uh, take me to my destination quickly and on, when I'm uh, having a break, take me to my holidays quickly, whatever. Uh, th there is literally millions and millions of dollars being poured into so many of these so-called televangelists and the like. Um, but it's not only uh, the, the, there are shepherds who are not only fleecing the flock by taking their money, but they're shepherds who are using the flock for their own advancement. Uh, there's this, uh, there's a, you know, this terrible thing called narcissism, and, and when a pastor is narcissistic, it's very sad because the congregation is used to prop up the pastor. Uh, I, I just pray that uh, the responsibility and privilege that, that I have as pastor We'll, we'll, we'll never degenerate into something like that. I mean, what a horrible experience for the flock. Um, there are still bad shepherds today. There were bad shepherds back then. There are bad shepherds today. But the Lord Jesus, he is what? The good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. A Learjet, thank you. A Learjet. A Learjet is what I want. Is that so? Graham is saying, "Why well, we should be raising money for a Learjet?" I don't know. Where do, where do you keep a Learjet anyway? Um, uh, so, so there's a picture. Now we're, we're still asking this question: Why shepherds? And I think that we're beginning to see that there is this real sense that the shepherds here is the introduction of a king who is the king uh, in the line of David and David who as Joanne has mentioned before also was a shepherd David was a shepherd shepherding the sheep before he became a king and his kingly activities were shaped in his shepherding uh, so Jesus here is the good shepherd here is the shepherds uh, here they are the ones who hear this message and uh, and they become good shepherds in the terms that they go out and they speak the message to others. They're no longer fleecing the flock. Just have a look at that. They hurry off. They do what the angel says. And then they, what do they do? Spread the word. They spread the word uh, concerning what had been told them about this child. Now, what had they been told about this child? What they had been told about this child was that today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So we've got that one. And you'll know who he is because you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Remember that phrase? Because what happens? Later on. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And they're saying this is it, it's happened just as we were told. Yes, wrapped in cloth or wrapped in linen. And yes, lying in a manger. Here is the shepherd of shepherds, the shepherd's shepherd, the king of the king's king, the Lord's Lord. Uh, here are good shepherds who are doing the right thing. 
Now, another suggestion for you to think about. How is Jesus described by the angels? I'll give you a hint. I save it. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. That cloths is linen, wrapped in linen. Uh, yes, Joanne says, interesting that they were told by the angels, not by Mary. She's still pondering. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm still trying to reflect on that. That seems to be a very key part of Luke's account. And Mary's pondering uh, is something that I think we're meant to ponder. Um, uh, she's trying to work it out. She's trying to understand it. I think we might too quickly look back at Mary and think, oh, well, she, she knew everything. She just knew what was going on. Well, no, really, she, she's had you know, nine months before... Uh, a visit from an angel, which I don't know, took 10 minutes or something. Um, I would imagine over nine months, she'd have been thinking, my goodness, what, what was going on there? Trying to work this stuff out. And now what she's pondering in her heart is the arrival of the shepherds. So I wonder if there's any sense that this pondering, where is it? There it is. Or treasured. Yes, treasured or pondered. I'll just highlight that in her heart. She pondered, oops, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So what's she pondering? She's pondering shepherds are turning up. Shepherds. And I suppose at some sense we're pondering the same thing. We are, we're saying shepherds. Shepherds are turning up. Here, here is the promised shepherd. Now let me go back, as I promised I would, to Ezekiel chapter 34. So let's just uh, get that one. Verse 7. I said that I would uh, read a large slab, but I just hope that you're able to uh, pick up here this very strong theme of shepherding and see what God promises about the shepherd. So we know from the previous section that there are bad shepherds, and the sheep are wandering, what is the answer? Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd, and so has been plundered and has become food for all of the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock, but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, therefore, shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look for them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after. Oh, I can only do a green one there. I will. Oops, I want to get these right. Oops, I can't do the whole lot. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on the Cloud, a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land. I will, oops, come on, thank you. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel and in the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will, I hope you're getting the point, tend them in a good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will, oops, let me try that again, oops. 
I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will. Oops, I've got to make that green. Uh, I will shepherd the flock with justice. As for you, my flock, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will judge between one sheep and the other, between the rams and the goats. Uh, Matthew 25 might jump to mind. Uh, the sheep and the goats. It is not enough for you to. Uh, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture? Must you also trample the rest of the pasture with your feet? Is it not enough for you to drink clear water? Must you also muddy the rest with your feet? Must my flock feed on what you have trampled and drink, and what you have muddled with your feet? And then it goes on. Uh, I will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. So here we've got a judgment of the shepherds and then even looks like the sheep have been treating one another badly uh, because you shove with flank and shoulder butting all the weak sheep with your horns until you have driven them away I will here we go again I will I will save my flock oops didn't work and they will no longer be plundered I will judge between one sheep and the other I'll place over them one shepherd. Oh goodness, here we go. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So let's just have a look, have a think about this passage. All of those I wills, I will, I will, I will, I will, I myself, I will, I will, I will do this. So here is the promise of a shepherd to come who will be God himself. And then God here in Ezekiel says he will place over them one shepherd, my servant David. Now already remember what we were told uh, back here that he is... Uh, in the town of David, he is beforehand in the line of David. He is the son of David. He is the promised son. Well, here's the promised one. Here's the promised one who, how do we work this out? Because God's going to place one shepherd over them. But we've been told, God's going to place one shepherd over them. But we've been told that the one shepherd will be God. But then he says there, that his servant David will tend them and be their shepherd. So God will shepherd them and the son of David will shepherd them. How could God shepherd them and the son of David shepherd them? How do we work that? I will be, my, I will be their God and my servant David will be prince among them. Have a look at that. Uh, here we've got, oops, I missed a comment here. Cheryl Cooper, Jeremiah 23 is another passage that refers to shepherds destroying and scattering the flock. Yes, yep, Jeremiah 23, spot on. We might get there, maybe, we'll see. Probably not, haven't got much time left. Um, I, I really think here that here we've got this, this beginning, this in, in its genesis, its principial genesis, that is its very beginnings, the, the idea that the shepherd is going to be God but he's going to also shepherd through someone who is a son of David. So we know that the king is the great shepherd, is, the, is a shepherd king in the Old Testament. David was a shepherd king. But here God's going to be the shepherd king, and the shepherd king we find out is Jesus. So how could Jesus be the son of David and be God? How He can't be both, can he? How could he be a God and man? Well, there you go. Here is God in human flesh. Here is God turn up in the flesh. Here is the son of David who is the shepherd. Uh, remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He is the good shepherd. Um, and here we have this uh, classic piece. Um, Joan called, was Mary also related to David? Oh, well, that's a very tricky question. That's one I cannot answer here and now because it will distract us too far. Uh, I don't, to quickly say it, 
I don't think Mary is related to David. People will disagree with that, but I think Joseph is the one who is prominently in the line of David. Uh, that's why when Mary marries Joseph, even though the child is not biologically his, he is legally his in that he, uh, that, that's just the way it worked. You, you, it was like an adoption. Adoption is a genuine, you, you, that is your child. It's not an adopted child, this is your child, your daughter, your son, legally and right in, in the right sense. So, um, was Mary, oh yes. So that's a very quick answer there. I don't think Mary was related in the line of David. I could be wrong. Joseph definitely was though, and that's the one that's emphasized here. But I want to finish tonight by saying, um, uh, as we look at, sorry, I don't know if you can hear all that screaming in the background. That's my daughter shouting out at my son who's about to drive off, not angrily, but just saying goodbye. Um, what I want to point out is this, we'll go to here. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths. Wrapped in cloths. Is there anywhere else in the Bible that you remember someone wrapped in cloths? Even in Luke's Gospel, can you think of someone wrapped in cloths? I'm going to go to that passage and point it out because I think Luke is telling us something. So we're going to go to Luke. It's about uh, Luke 23. Let's go to that. I think it's Luke 23. So I'm just finding it while you're sitting there waiting. That's uh, Luke 24. Yes, we go. Ah, oh, no, here it is. Luke 23. Here we go. Just open that up and jump across to that. So Jesus has died, and here's the burial of Joseph. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea. He himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. We're going to find out about waiting for the kingdom of God this week at church, Anna and Simeon. Uh, going to Pilate, he asked for the body for Jesus' body. He took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed him or laid him in a tomb. So we've got this, yes, or Lazarus, so Laz yes, Moses, uh, Lazarus, Lazarus in John's Gospel, however, I suppose I want to point out here that in Luke's Gospel, he is bookending his Gospel with a reference to Jesus being wrapped in linen, laid in a manger. At the end, wrapped in linen, laid in a tomb. So the way he's come in, in incredible humility, and now in death. So uh, I know I've said before that one of the things I really don't like in the Bible is the headings, because the headings are put in there afterwards and they distract us. But there are still markers in the first century way of writing. And one of the markers was the repetition of ideas so that when you became familiar with a book, the more familiar you came, became with it, the more you would see repetition of ideas. And those were the markers. And here we have a repetition of Jesus being wrapped in cloths and being laid down. At the end, wrapped in cloths and being laid down. So we've got this bookend here of, yes, humility, and, uh, and in the end there about his death, but then what I want to show you is, as we go to this one, we see 
verse 12 of, of uh, Luke 24. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. I'm just going to scan down here because I want to show you something in a moment. Da, 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 right at the end there, so we'll come back to that. So I want to finish by pulling this together. Why shepherds? Yes, because they were certainly the... Um, that they were representative of possibly a lower class of people and they're told that the Saviour has been born to you, to you shepherds. Uh, it is for all people. So it's sort of like if you say it's for the bottom ones, it's going to go up to the top. The one that something for the top necessarily isn't for the bottom, but the one for the bottom is for all people. And then what they see is the one who was born in Bethlehem. Let's go to Bethlehem. So here are shepherds going to Bethlehem. Micah 5 is in the background. You read Micah 5. It says the ruler is coming from Bethlehem. And what's he going to be? He's going to be a shepherd. <laughs> He's going to be the shepherd of shepherds. And what do the shepherds see? They see one wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Yes, in humility, wrapped in cloths and lying in a tomb. Yes, in death. But that last word about the linen cloth is Peter coming in and saying, no longer is he wrapped in linen cloth. No longer is he there in some sort of humble state. No longer. He is in now an exalted state. He is now the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is now the son of David, uh, descended from David, raised from the dead. He is, uh, he, here is the one. And what I wanted to show you to finish off is the disciples then, what do they do? Then they worshipped him, him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now this is, unfortunately we don't see it as much in the English, but it is, uh, let me go to, uh, let me just jump that one out. And go back there. What do the its wording that is almost the same as here? That the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard. So here we've got shepherds, good shepherds, seeing the shepherd of shepherds in a feeding trough, going out speaking and praising God. At the end of Luke's Gospel, we've got the disciples, the apostles, who are now going out speaking and praising God. These are the new shepherds of Israel. The apostles are the good shepherds, the ones who follow the good shepherd. They are little shepherds, little good shepherds of Israel. They are going out to see that message. They're going to shepherd well. And that's why in 1 Peter chapter 5, he will speak to the shepherds and say, shepherd the flock of God that's been entrusted to you in, in Acts 19. Um, uh, not because you uh, must, oh, I've got to do it, no one else is going to do it, but because you're willing. There is that sense of, yeah, I want to do, th I want to be a servant to the people of God. I might be a, 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 a wise servant, I might be a great servant or a bad servant, I don't know, but I want to be a servant. There is to be a shepherd, an under-shepherd. So we're going to uh, pull up stumps there. I want to say thank you for this year of the drill down. We will return in February and we will uh, be having, uh, hopefully when as we get our things sorted out, we'll be having church online, uh, live streamed right from our services on Sunday morning. Uh, it's been so good to be with you uh, these Wednesday nights. I've really loved just diving into the passage a bit more and thinking through. Uh, you may have more questions. If you do have questions, if you're watching this later, then please, by all means, put some um, uh, questions in the comments and I'll see that there's some questions have been placed there and I'll come back to you and answer them. Well, I'll do my best to answer them anyway. So uh, that brings this year to an end. 
goodbye 2020 drill down. Hello, God willing, DV, the drill down 2021. So uh, thanks everybody. It's been good to be with you. I really hope you've been encouraged by this. Um, Christmas time is the time of the good shepherd turning up. He's a good shepherd. He's going to lay down, lay down his life for his sheep. And so let's shepherd well where we have opportunity. Uh, good stuff. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to fade to black and disappear. See ya.